Ira Goldstein is a PhD. He's the president of policy solutions at the Reinvestment Fund in Philadelphia. Uh, it's a result-oriented, socially responsible community investment group. Dr. Goldstein has conducted detailed spatial and statistical analyses of housing markets in many cities, ranging from Philadelphia to Detroit to San Antonio to New Orleans. These studies are used by local governments to craft policy responses and allocate scarce resources based on local market conditions. He also has conducted studies of mortgage foreclosures and abusive lending practices. His work supports civil rights and consumer protection cases brought by federal, state, and local governments. Prior to joining TRF, Dr. Goldstein was the Mid-Atlantic Director of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. He is a former member of the Federal Reserve Board's Consumer Advisory Council and a current member of the Research Advisory Board of the Center for Responsible Lending. The Reinvestment Fund completed the market valuation analysis for New Orleans in early 2013. The market value analysis is a tool designed to assist the private market and government officials in identifying and comprehending the various elements of local real estate markets, and he'll tell us more about that. Um, it is based fundamentally on local administrative data sources. By using an MBA, public sector officials and private sector, private market actors can more precisely craft intervention strategies in weak markets and support sustainable growth in stronger market segments. So this is an important time in New Orleans. We're starting to look at, very, at our data as a way to drive the next act in our development process. So we're very excited about having him here. Thank you for coming, and welcome Ira Goldstein. Well, good evening. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Well, um, it is really my honor and pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I don't often get invited to speak in audiences such as this. Maybe you'll see why. Uh, <laughs> But uh, no, I, I really am pleased to be here to talk about something that we created back in Philadelphia oh, almost a dozen years ago now um, and have brought to the city of New Orleans. And it's our hope that at the end of the analysis that we will be able to provide some much needed data support so that the city can thrive and grow. A uh, little bit uh, background about the reinvestment fund. We are a community development financial institution or CDFI. We are certified by the Treasury. In fact, we were just recently recertified by the Treasury. Um, and we were basically um, understood best as a lending institution with a public purpose. And so our goal is to use our capital, our money, our uh, knowledge of the market, and our ability to innovate in that marketplace to build up wealth and economic opportunity for people um, in places that don't have an awful lot of it. We do that through our various lines of business that include our lending, and we are now, uh, we have been since the start, lending for uh, the creation or rehabilitation of affordable housing, and that's both owner and rental stock. Um, commercial real estate, we were one of the first to be able to figure out how to loan to charter schools, and we essentially created a charter school market in the city of Philadelphia and then uh, beyond. Um, child care centers, arts and culture oriented spaces, and most recently we've been getting involved in these uh, financing of federally qualified health centers. Um, we finance small businesses. Uh, in the last couple of years we became very active in financing uh, food retail, and that is uh, everything from farmers markets and food banks and the like all the way up to full service supermarkets. The caveat is, though, that they need to be in places where the access to fresh, the, there's a lack of equitable access to fresh food. And that's how we decide where we're going to go, aside from the fact that they need to be viable businesses. Um, we've been uh, financing sustainable energy for, um, I think, about pretty much our entire existence. We finance wind, solar power, um, the wind farm out in Somerset, Pennsylvania, which some of you will remember from um, 9-11 period, uh, there was a wind farm right out there that we had financed. Um, and uh, we have, in the last few years, been fortunate to be able to finance through the New Markets Tax Credit Vehicle. We've been awarded several times. And as you know, those are generally commercial-related investments. We have a small 
a development company, TRF Development Partners. Um, they are very active in building affordable housing in that portion of Baltimore, right sort of in the shadow of the Johns Hopkins Hospital Complex area. It's a very, very distressed area. It's the area that they filmed The Wire in, for those of you familiar with it. Um, and they have been slowly but surely essentially building in that place and building a very strong and viable community. Uh, they like to talk about themselves essentially as the implementation arm of the work that I do in policy solutions, which is research um, on real estate markets, various aspects of them, um, and a variety of other things. Um, and we also have policymap.com, which uh, somebody was commenting, you were commenting that it's hard to get census data right now. You can get it on policymap.com if you like. It's available, it's up and running. <laughs> Uh, but it is, it's an online database um, and mapping tool that allows folks essentially to access all kinds of information about the community they live in across the country. We created it a number of years ago in an effort to um, essentially democratize access to information easily. Um, and now it is uh, proliferating really across universities, uh, private sector, government sector, et cetera. Um, we've been around since 85. We financed over a billion dollars in these sorts of investments, which makes us one of the largest of the CDFIs in the country. Um, and here's all our stats. I mean, but I, frankly, I'm quite proud of the fact that our organization has created or renovated or preserved more than 20,000 housing units, um, about two thirds of which are renter occupied. Over the course of time, that varies depending upon the nature of the market. 37,000 charter school slots, which if you sort of put them together would be one of the largest school districts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. 600 businesses and over 5 million uh, megawatts of energy created or preserved through the efforts of our investors. So the topic today really is to talk about the market analysis, but I want you to understand the context from which it comes. Um, you know, we created this at a moment in time in Philadelphia when um, the city was in a, uh, actually coming out of a fairly rough spot. We had a very popular governor, uh, a mayor who went on to be governor, Ed Rendell, and he did great stuff in the downtown of Philadelphia. But the neighborhoods of Philadelphia hadn't done all that well, and the resources that were necessary were um, not all that plentiful. And today, you know, we're here to talk about the New Orleans MVA, and uh, New Orleans is uh, trying to tackle the problems of the community that it works in, uh, that the various organizations within the city work. At a moment in time, really, when federal dollars to deal with this kind of stuff are on the decline. And there really is no prospects of these things getting bigger in any time future. You know, it's like, listen to the news today. I mean, it's not even clear that we'll get anything close to what we have now. But, you know, you're, what you're looking at, and there's a chart of CDBG allegations, which is Community Development Block Grants. And if I use an acronym, just stick up your hand if you don't know what it is, and I'll spell it out for you. Um, but that's CDBG allocations for 2008 through 12. The little bars in the middle represent the percentage change from year to year. But what you'll see is in 2008, 9, 10, during the recession, the government was pumping more money into this because there was a recognition that you needed to do something to help keep communities basically viable. However, once ended, um, the amount of money that has gone into these block granted related activities, which could be housing and community development, streets and all sorts of things that grantees use it for, those things, those dollars dropped 20 some percent in 2011 and another 15% in 2012. And it's likely, you know, if we ever get a 2013 budget, which we probably won't, we don't exactly have one now, we just keep getting these things, or a 2014 budget, it's not likely it's going to get to these levels. Now, what changes the picture here, which we didn't have in the city of Philadelphia, was we didn't have disasters and we didn't have disaster recovery funds, which were really quite significant, albeit probably inadequate to deal with the problem that um, everybody was confronting. But those dollars, just to get a sense of the scale and scope of it, the dis disaster recovery dollars that came into New Orleans from Katrina and Rita, um, really dwarfed even just the full CDBG allocation for the country, just for one, you know, for two events actually. 
But those dollars are not coming again unless, heaven forbid, there's another disaster, right? And it's not even clear if there is, frankly, that those dollars are coming again. And so we think about this as a way of saying, in this era where there is the new normal of doing less with more, the best way to do less with more is to understand more about what you're doing and to understand the environments within which you're doing it. So we have this market analysis. It is a tool that we created, as I said, back in Philadelphia about a dozen or so years ago. And it relies very heavily on administrative data sources. Um, collected, validated, mapped, statistically analyzed, and spatially analyzed, all in an effort to give decision makers, people who are allocating resources, deciding how much resources there are to begin with, you know, essentially a, a picture of the nature of the places wherein those dollars need to be invested. And that's what this thing is about. All too often as we go from city to city, Folks are dealing in the dark. They don't know what the nature of the housing market is. They know that North Philadelphia is a distressed neighborhood, but they don't know the dimensions of it. They don't know the various characteristics of it. And so our notion was if we could get the data out there, it would be a service. Uh, these are the kinds of places that we've done this work, uh, really big and growing places like San Antonio. We just wrapped up Houston. Tiny little places like Reading, Pennsylvania, um, we're active right now in the city of St. Louis, which is roughly comparable in size to um, the city of New Orleans. Uh, Prince George's County, Maryland, that's the county that wraps the District of Columbia. Uh, Pittsburgh, some of these places we've gone to multiple times and redone the work. You'll see a couple waves of Baltimore as we get later on into the presentation. But I would say that you know the good fortune that we've had to go to all these places and do this work makes each one just a little better because it gives you a different sense of scale and scope and complexity, which you can then sort of fold into the next. I gotta say probably the biggest learning experience for us was Detroit, and you'll see some of Detroit as well. Our work here was in fact supported by Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, and I believe it was funds that came through the Technical Assistance Program associated with the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. That, for those of you who uh, don't know, was three waves, I believe, of, of uh, stimulus funding. One, towards the end of the uh, Bush administration, the Housing Economic Recovery Act and then ARA, which I just can never remember what that acronym stands for, but that was the uh, Obama stimulus, and then there was another round just after that. And that put about, oh, I think about eight or nine billion dollars into funds for um, demolition, rehabilitation, land banking, all sorts of things related to vacant and foreclosed properties. But basically, it was funding that was associated with that program that got us into New Orleans. And our work here, essentially, we, we acted as if, although HUD was paying the bill, but practically, and, and for all intents and purposes, the Redevelopment Authority here in New Orleans, or NORA, was our client. And we worked very closely with a number of folks. Jeff, who runs the uh, NORA, was uh, engaged in many of our meetings and validation trips. And his colleague, David Lessinger, was very much involved and really quite, um, not only just involved, but I would say, you know, good critics, good productive critics of what we were doing. Uh, they knew their market, they knew various aspects of it, and they were able to bring that to the table. But also various offices within the mayor's suite of, of uh, programs were involved. And as I would say, uh, also the Greater New Orleans Community Data Center provided some data. So all these folks and all these offices from federal and state and local all contributed to what we were able to produce here. Now, getting into the market analysis, what is it? Uh, like any form of analysis, you know, if you're going to be uh, proper about it, what you like to do is to give folks a sense of what assumptions you enter into as you do it. The first assumption is that um, although we might be most attentive to in some ways uh, because of the nature of the, the dollars that are available to us, certain segments of the real estate market underlying our analysis and underlying our approach is that the entirety of the city of New Orleans or Detroit or St. Louis or Philadelphia or Baltimore, the entirety of the city is what's relevant to us and the entirety of the city uh, represent the customers of the services and the resources that government has to offer. We also work under the notion that subsidy is scarce and, um, and generally speaking, 
it cannot create a market where there is none. Um, we, I think we, all of us, uh, depending upon where you've been, what other cities you've been to, you could probably all find places where millions of dollars have landed, except that there's no visible evidence of it anywhere, other than, I like to kid, the receipts, hopefully, right? <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, the subsidy is never really enough. And, you know, if you go into it thinking, I'm going to just use my subsidy and sort of eat my way out of this hole, it's not going to work. And so what you have to do is adopt a mindset that says uh, public subsidy has to be used to leverage or to clear the path for private investment, to bring the private market in and to bring it along, but to bring it along with, a, with an eye towards what it is that you're trying to accomplish in a place. We also have this um, underlying assumption of building from strength. I mentioned that my colleague works in the city of Baltimore, in a very, very distressed part of Baltimore. We did this work in Camden, New Jersey, in Detroit. There is no place, as weak as it is, that doesn't have a node of strength upon which to build. And the, really, the, 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 the trick is to figure out what that is. It could be um, an institution of place, in the case of Baltimore, Johns Hopkins Hospital. In the case of Philadelphia, uh, people think about Penn, uh, University of Pennsylvania, and Drexel and the Science Center that's there. Um, it could be our natural resources. You all have wonderful natural resources in terms of parks and rivers. We have similar. So it's a matter of essentially in those distressed places, finding those nodes of strength and building off of those nodes. And that's very different than hopping right into the middle of weakness and again trying to build your way out of it. That tends not to work. I think the lesson of time is that doesn't work. And lastly, and this is the one that, believe it or not, you occasionally get some consternation about. You ought to make decisions to invest based in data. Um, <laughs> that sometimes troubles people, and it troubles politicians sometimes because they hear from their constituents that I need this, or I want to do this, or this project needs to be done, et cetera. Um, but to the extent that you can, to introduce some objective information that's properly analyzed, properly put together, and laid out, that is what will maximize the likelihood of making good decisions. So those become our underlying assumptions as to how we do the work. Now, how do we do it? We get a variety of data layers that we uh, geocode. That's a process of taking things that have addresses associated with them, finding where those addresses land in space with a longitude and a latitude, and putting them down very precisely on a map. That's what geocoding is. We geocode them, and uh, we inspect them, and we validate them. So um, we came here actually several times over the course of darn near a year validating the data sets. It was a much longer slog than we often have because the data were troubling. Not that they weren't troubling. The data were problematic in terms of uh, understanding what they represented and accuracy and things of that nature. So we did. We went out and we're driving up and down the streets trying to understand you know, like why a home sale price looks the way it does when there's no home there or whatever. I mean, you get the picture. Um, <clears throat> We then aggregate things, all those data points, up to the census block group. Most of you are familiar with census tracts. Think of block groups as being about a sixth the size of a census tract. And we like them because those block groups are small enough that it allows you to see on the map and detect what you would detect if you were walking down the street. So as a place changes from weak to strong or what have you, um, you can see it in a block group where at a census tract level you can't see it. We get all that together and then we use a, what's known as a statistical cluster analysis. And for those of you who are statistically sophisticated, you'll excuse me, I'm going to try and give a pretty uh, basic understanding of what that is. Think of it as essentially like a coin sorter where we've attached characteristics, and you'll see what they are in a second, to each one of these block groups. And the statistical analysis is sorting them out so that you end up with groups of places that share common constellations of characteristics. Okay? It's different than things like factor analysis and other sorts of analyses that are doing the same sort of data reduction. But this is all about finding common constellations of characteristics. So what we do then is we lay those out on a map, and we go back into the field, and we visually inspect. 
and we go back and forth and we inspect and model and inspect and model until we get it right. And I will say that um, you know, out of the six or 700 or so block groups in the city of New Orleans, uh, frankly, I wouldn't be so bold as to say that we got every single one of them right, but I would say that we visited probably the overwhelming majority of the block groups within the city of New Orleans. And I would say also that you know, between our validation and the validation of many groups the size of this one or larger, of folks who were sort of really scrutinizing the map, I think that the feedback was pretty good that we got it right. So that's how we do what we do. And now we have the New Orleans MVA. So what went into it? Um, we got residential sale prices. We like to use sale prices rather than census values. And we do that because, well, if for no other reason that our experience in Detroit convinced us that census home values were just wildly inaccurate. Um, you know, you're gonna see a map of Detroit uh, in a moment. Actually, after we get out of New Orleans, you'll see a map of Detroit, and you'll see a set of home sale prices. Suffice it to say, they represent about 10% of the average price that folks were saying they thought their homes were work in this, uh, worth in the city of Detroit. They were not only off by orders of magnitude, they didn't even necessarily correlate in space. So in other words, it wasn't even like the high-priced areas in the census comport it with the high priced areas based on these values. But the values work really well because that says what people are willing to pay for a piece of property in the open market. And that's why we like that. We're approaching it, we're investors after all, and we're scientists, but we're investors, and we're approaching it like investors. We also look at the variation of prices. We look at the extent to which uh, the rental stock has been subsidized. We look at foreclosure filings. I like to think of that as sort of the financial morbidity of the area, right? Um, we looked at uh, tenure or owner occupancy, uh, however you prefer to say it. We had a number of measures of vacancy here in New Orleans because there were really a couple different kinds of vacancies, different than what we observed in other places, necessitating a couple different approaches to it. And then we had um, vac uh, uh, dormant parcels, vacant land basically. Um, all of that, uh, and I'm going to show you what some of these things lay out as. So this is a map of the city of New Orleans. Um, I feel a little inadequate in architecture school because I know that they always make much nicer pictures than sociologists make. But we'll just have to live with these for the moment. Um, <clears throat> the map is shaded by block groups, so each one of these is a little block group, right? And um, where we had fewer than five sales, you see crosshatch. Some of those are non-residential areas. Some of those are areas where it's just all rental stock and homes don't sell, right? Um, the prices are shaded so that the lightest shaded areas, uh, the map is shaded, so that those are under $20,000 in the lightest yellow and in the darkest brown, it's over 300,000. Now there's a whole lot over 300,000, quite frankly. There's a bunch over a million too. Uh, but for purposes of what we were doing, once you reached a certain point, the difference in terms of impact and program design and the like really wasn't material after you reached about $300,000. So that is what home sale prices look like. They should comport with what you know um, your area to be. I believe we're in a pretty reasonably high priced area right now, if I've got my uh, <laughs> GPS on. Okay. And that doesn't count the tuition. Um, this is how variable prices are. This map is shaded so that the more darkly shaded the area, more variable the pricing. Um, the less, uh, the more lightly shaded, the less variable. Think about, you know, I come from a city of Philadelphia, full of row houses. We have, you know, neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood of the same house, one after the other, all connected, and they all sell for $75,000, plus or minus a few thousand dollars based on condition. Um, New Orleans doesn't exactly have that, but there are swaths where you see great similarity in the market. This is a representation of that dissimilarity in the market. And we also have experience uh, that suggests to us that where you see great variability in the market can sometimes suggest an area in transition. Uh, this is owner occupancy. Uh, the more darkly shaded the area, uh, the, more higher, uh, the higher the percentage owner occupancy. 
And you know, in the darkest areas, you're looking at upwards of 75%. In the more light, uh, more, more, more lightly shaded areas, it could be under 25%. Okay. Uh, now, this is foreclosures. And uh, New Orleans is uh, part of Louisiana's foreclosure structure. So this is non-judicial. It's a little different than Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, where we have a judicial process. Here, you can pretty much just go ahead and sell the collateral when somebody stops paying the mortgage. In a place like Philadelphia, it's triggered by a lawsuit, and then a judge has to order it. But what you're seeing here is a map where we've shaded um, the area based on the percentage of properties that had a mortgage foreclosure associated with them. Um, and again, the more darkly shaded areas, the higher the foreclosure level. Now, this is through the period, frankly, that is the highest uh, rate of foreclosure in the nation's history, pretty much. You know, post the Great Depression anyway, right? I mean, so the foreclosure rates, and they're finally starting to come down, but not down to where they were when we started this whole thing. This is, uh, we call it vacant but habitable. Um, these are properties that we believe to be um, without residence in them at this time, except that if you were to look at them, you would say, mm, that's the kind of place I might want to live in. And we s differentiate those from the properties that, and we still saw many, that still have the, uh, the spray paint on the front, uh, front wall, right? But these are places that you could still live in, but they don't have occupants in them at this time. The more darkly shaded the area, the higher the percentage of vacancy on this measure. This is vacant parcels. And um, I think here, more so than other places that we work, it's really important to recognize that vacant parcels represent both, potentially, um, a drag on a neighborhood, as well as an opportunity in a neighborhood. And in some places, if you look up in the northwest of the city, up in Lakeview, those are places where those vacant lots, it's almost a misnomer to call them, um, unimproved lots, let's call them, um, those could be selling for $100,000, dollars $150,000. There are other parts of New Orleans where those vacant lots have almost no cash value. And there are other parts of New Orleans where they have value as being essentially an adjunct to somebody's property who lives next door to them. Okay. Again, the map is shaded so the darker the area, the higher the density. But again, this is a variable you have to be careful about because it really does play both ways. Um, this is where you have a substandard structure. Um, you know, that is a little more concentrated, quite frankly, in a few uh, portions of New Orleans. Again, the darkest areas are where you're having great concentrations of substandards. Okay, so this is the market analysis. We took all those things, we laid them out on a map as you saw them, we validated, we verified, we statistically analyzed them, and we produced this block group map that shows every block group in the city of, Hilda, in the city of New Orleans that we could in fact code um, as in a shade of purple or blue or beige or orange or red. Generally speaking, the strongest markets in New Orleans are those that you'll see shaded in purple. The most challenged markets are the ones that you'll see shaded in red and orange. And I'll show you in one second what those characteristics are. But I would point out to you there's some very important stuff to think about here when you see this map. It's not only is this right. Is it right that this is a light purple and that's a dark purple? In other words, this is a stronger market than that. That's important. But what's also important is what's proximate to things. So if you think about what I laid out in one of the earlier slides about um, building from strength, sometimes the strength could be a contiguous strong real estate market. And all you're really trying to do with your investment is do the sorts of things that will allow the power of that market to uh, positively influence the more distressed place. So when you see a place that has a strong market next to a weaker market, and there are a number of them um, around the city of New Orleans, those represent opportunities. Those represent opportunities to think about things that may not be in the normal uh, realm of thinking about community development where we think about building houses, but it could be streetscapes that open things up and smooth transitions from one place to another. But whatever it is, Think about always when you look at one of these maps, what does 
the contiguity of one market to the next uh, represent. Okay? Now here's the characteristics of those markets. The purple market, the deepest purple, has a sale price of $344,000 on average, and frankly, it goes way up from there, as you well know. Um, and we've organized these things by sale price range. The most challenged has an average sale price of $9,500. But these things don't operate linearly, quite frankly, right? And they don't operate just all in the same direction. For example, this is um, the percent owner occupied. Well, what you see is there's actually, you know, the highest rates of owner occupancy are really somewhere in the middle of the market and you have one of your strongest real estate markets with one of your lower rates of owner occupancy. That is not uncommon in cities that we've studied. Uh, you will see uh, the foreclosures. Foreclosures are not necessarily highest in the weakest market, but they're oftentimes, as they are here in New Orleans, uh, a rung or two up. And that's oftentimes a result of the fact that once the markets get so distressed, there's nothing left to foreclose on. Right, so the lenders don't even pursue them. But that is not an uncommon pattern. And I would say that, you know, when you have a moment, if you have the interest, you'll study this thing and understand a little bit about what these market constellations are and recognize we didn't preordain anything to go together. All we did was allow the data to essentially sift itself out and show us where the natural breaks in the market are. Okay? Um, this is a, a table that shows you what percentage of New Orleans real estate market is in each of these different market types. So uh, if you look at the two strongest real estate markets in New Orleans, you got about 33, 34% of the housing stock, and you have about 32% of the population. In the weakest markets, you have about 9.5% oh, of the housing stock, and about 9% of the population. Compare that to the city of Philadelphia, and I'll show you that map momentarily. Frankly, they're not directly comparable, but in Philadelphia, you find 42% of the population and 40% of the housing units in markets like these, as compared to only, I say only, I mean, to me, it's hopeful, it's manageable, only 9% of the housing units and 9% of the stock. Um, we find 6% of uh, the population and 9% of the housing units in the strongest markets, you're looking at three, four times that here in New Orleans. And to me, that suggests that this is really a different kind of real estate market than some of the other places that we've worked in. And there's some, to me, that's positive signs, frankly. It's not necessarily the case that you want everything to be blue and purple. Not everybody could afford to be in blue and purple. But you want them to be stable, strong real estate markets, right? So let's look at Philly. We used many of the same kinds of indicators, sale prices, variation of prices, subsidized rental stock, vacancy, et cetera. And here's Philadelphia's MVA. And look at this vast expanse of distress in the city of Philadelphia. There, here. Here's the University of Pennsylvania right here. So right around it, pretty strong. If you get too far out, not too far out, if you get a little bit out, um, the market's really weakened. If you were to see this map from a couple of years ago, what you would see is essentially think about that middle part of Philadelphia as being sort of like a water balloon. And the strength of the downtown real estate market just punching its way up, and it just took that balloon and sort of forced it out to the sides. That's what happened to Philadelphia's real estate markets over the last eight to 10 years. Um, but again, the preponderance of red here versus in New Orleans and orange here is vastly different. And we have some very strong real estate markets, but they're concentrated in just a couple places. Our downtown, which is expanding, uh, undoubtedly, our art museum area, uh, and then up in sort of a, the main line of Philadelphia, inside of Philadelphia, called Chestnut Hill. Okay. And here's ours. Our price ranges are a little bit different than yours. They're actually up a bit higher. Sorry. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But the other, the constellation of the characteristics is not all that much different, frankly. They're quite similar. And so what it's saying is our market is sifting itself out and sorting itself out very differently. Now, in the interest of time, I want to get into Detroit. This is the city of Detroit. Notice 
all the red, right? Vast expanses of the city of Detroit are in the most distressed of real estate markets. And moreover, I'd like to draw your attention to these areas that are red with that crosshatch in them. That means there were fewer than five real estate transactions in a two year time period, but we couldn't not code a third of the city of Detroit. So we had to figure out essentially, given the other indicators that we had, what it looked like, and then sort of code based on that. You know, we're dealing with essentially what amounted to, and you all do this in your analyses, I guess, your missing data problem. Except for missing data meant something here. These are dead real estate markets. In two years, you don't have five sales. Lots of them. Okay. Where, where is the Woodward Corridor on that map? The Woodward Corridor is, um, it's going to be, is. yep, it's going to be right up here. Right, so this is the downtown. This is the Woodward Corridor. Um, there's gonna be a three and a half mile trolley that takes you from about here to about there. And then there's four and a half, five, four and a half, five more miles that's just basically cut off. But that's the Woodward Corridor. For those who are interested in things that we're interested in, if you're here, presumably you're interested in it, you have to go to Detroit, you have to see it. There's nothing quite like it anywhere else that I've seen. The highest end of the market was $125,000 in Detroit, and the lowest end of the market was about $5,500. And the vacancy rates and the foreclosure rates were just something that you couldn't imagine. Okay, so I want to be cognizant of time. We've got about another 15 minutes, so I'm going to try and fly through a few things. I want to talk about who uses this, what they use it for, um, how you guide program development, and influence quality of life. So who uses it? Frankly, lots of city officials, redevelopment authorities, city planners, people who run administrative agencies like licenses and inspections folks. The arts and culture people are using it, and they're finding, actually there's some very neat research that a colleague at Penn did, was finding what differentiates uh, distressed real estate markets over the last five or six years that actually sort of held their own or even performed a little better was where there was um, a significant level of cultural engagement. And we sort of reckon that that has to do a little bit with sort of the, the connection of that place to the rest of the region's economy rather than having it sort of walled off. Nonprofit CDCs are using it, um, or CDC. Local philanthropy is using it. Um, we have a Wells Fargo Regional Foundation where any of their Philadelphia or any of the other places that we did this work, any of their grantees, they want them to use it in their planning and implementation. And of course, we're using it on our development partners. Now, in terms of market intelligence, this is Philadelphia's MVA, and um, on the right, this is a map of how sale prices changed over the last five or so years. Where you see purple, these are areas that appreciated. Where you see uh, brown, these are areas that depreciated. <coughs> Excuse me. And <clears throat> on that map to the right, what you're seeing is an identification of places where uh, the market is moving in, let's call it the wrong direction. So these areas over the course of time were distressed and got even more distressed, right? These are areas that are moving up. Anything with a blue outline, these are areas that are moving up in the real estate market. But it gives you a sense of, you know, is there some momentum for you to capture as you're uh, going about making your plans for investment? Or is there momentum in a, the direction that you need to figure out the strategy to stop it? Is it? And can you stop it, right? D do you have the tools to stop it? This is looking at the same thing with respect to mortgage foreclosure. And there, it's a different pattern. But if you look up in that part up there, we see all those red places. Those are a very interesting set of communities that are, uh, had been really the middle class African American portion of Philadelphia. And those markets are being hammered by foreclosures just hammered. The first wave through the predatory lending and the second wave was just flat out recession. And this, so this is multiple waves. And those communities, not that many years ago, were not shaded as yellow. And I would guarantee that if we do this in a couple years, once all that stuff takes hold, those yellow areas are more likely to have shifted down. 
Also measuring change. Here's Baltimore. Here's the city of Baltimore. Inner Harbor, for those of you who know it, here's the harbor, Inner Harbor area. And that's, you know, the strong part of Baltimore. Um, <clears throat> but what we did is we've done now three waves of MVAs, and hopefully we'll do a fourth this year. Um, and what we've done here is to try and measure how the communities have changed. Any place that you see a gray dot has been basically stable over the course of about a three-year time period, three to four-year time period. Now here, you're seeing blue dots, and the depth of the blue represents how much change there has been upgrading in the market. And notice the contiguity of these things again, right? These are not just you know, haphazard across the map. Generally speaking, where you see one, you see a couple more close by. And that's because markets really do sort of, they're not constrained by the oddities of the boundaries of census block groups, right? It's what people experience. It's what people see and feel as they walk around their places. And so it's not, you know, we, it's, it's not uncommon then to see these patterns of multiple. And these are distressed real estate markets that are showing upward ticks. These are the areas that went down. So um, these are places where whatever's happening or not happening, it's not stabilizing those real estate markets. And this is the kind of thing that the city of Baltimore takes and then starts to dig in and try and figure out what they were doing or not doing in certain places. To my mind, it's once you get a couple waves of these things and can really start to play out what is your strategy, what are you going to invest, at what level are you going to invest, and then really start to see whether or not you're turning uh, the tide in the community. Are you in a, are you in a uh, is, is, is Baltimore having a um, decline in population? In, in other words, are the people out migrating? Baltimore's population, as I, it declined between 2000 and 2010. The contemporary estimates are that it seems to have about leveled out. Its population loss, though, was not as significant. And New Orleans is really hard to measure, frankly. I don't know how best to measure New Orleans. But certainly Detroit or St. Louis, it's not on the order of that. You know, Detroit was over 2 million. They're 700,000 now. St. Louis was 700 and something thousand or about 300,000 now. So no, it's not. I mean, if you go back in time, maybe. But they seem to have leveled off. And this is Detroit. So uh, this is, I'm glad you're going to get to see this. This shows you the real estate sale prices in 2011 and 10. These places are, in these lightest shades of yellow, under $2,500. Under $2,500 for a place with a structure, right? And frankly, once you get into the ten to 25000 range, there are places you could actually live in, right? Look at that. There's just a few places in Detroit where home sale prices are over $75,000. And the amazing thing about Detroit that you don't see in other places is the amazing proximity between the, 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 the vast extremes. So you could go up there. You see where that brown spot is up there right next to Route 1, which is that Woodward Carter? So you go right over there, and you see places that, like, Barry Gordy lived in and all the other, you know, great spots. John Sally had a place there, the basketball player. These are amazing places. You could throw a baseball into a place that would be um, a post-apocalyptic. I mean, literally that close, one to the other. Um, so, in any event, we do this because we wanted to be able to show Detroit a little bit about where they're seeing a little bit of positive momentum and where they're seeing it go in the opposite direction. Detroit actually had some um, some target areas that they focused on. One was up near that number one up there, and they liked it because it was a mixture of markets. They were going to play out that theory of using a strong market to sort of anchor the others. There was one more towards the middle, and then one in the southwest. And in the southwest, things basically held their own, as did up there. Now, that's interesting because Detroit isn't a place that over the last three or four years really held its own. Notwithstanding the stories that you hear about the neat little things that are happening, they're neat little things in a place with 700,000 people, right? I mean, you've got you to gotta get a sense of the scale, right? I'm going to skip this because I would like to leave a couple minutes if there are, and just go to this last thing. 
One of the things I think that is important in terms of understanding all this is the potential criticism that people have lodged around this issue. When you make out these different market types of cities, what you're essentially doing is preparing, uh, preparing the government to have the information base to say, I'm not doing anything over there because it's just so bad. And the fact of the matter is, it's quite the opposite. In fact, and you remember, our first assumption is the entirety of the city, uh, strong markets, weak markets, middle markets, they're all customers. Having said that, the important thing is to recognize that once you have a good pulse on the real estate market, a good measure of the pulse of that real estate market, and you have a good sense of the things that you have available, what are your tools, what are your resources, of what size are they, you can make the appropriate decision about where to do one thing and where to do something else. And you may look at a real estate market, and there's lots of real estate markets in the city of Detroit where I would not say, go ahead and build a couple houses, nonprofit organization here. Why? Because I saw a place, I actually saw a place that was as vacant, if you went out to the, to the uh, oval there, or the circle, and stood there and envisioned none of the buildings and just chest high grass. That's a spot in Detroit. And envision three houses, just three new houses put up by a, a nonprofit. One was vacant, one was I don't think ever occupied, and one may, it may have been occupied, it's not sure. But they did nothing for anybody. They did nothing for the, the three families potentially that could have lived in them. So the notion is, understand your market, understand the dimensions of it, understand your tools, and then put them together. So in a place like that, where there were some still some families remaining, it's not build one or two houses. Maybe if you have the ability to do a 250-unit tax credit project, maybe that could be stimulative of a real estate market. But failing that, these little piddling things are not going to do it. So, but that, the important thing to remember is there's still people there. So what do those people need? Those people need public safety, and those people need access to a good school, and the people who are living there need access to a street light. They might need access to job training, social services, human services. So what you're saying is essentially not forget about that place, but recognize the tools you have and match those tools to conditions. We'll sometimes work with folks with something that looks like this. Here's sort of ideally, those are your real estate markets. And obviously, you know, you might have a few more, you might have a few less, whatever. And here's a sampling of activities. So you say, what are the things that we as a city do? We demolish properties. We encapsulate them and make them ready for resale. We remove dead trees. We had hundreds of thousands of dead trees in Philadelphia. We remove abandoned cars. We abate nuisances. But we also do things like we have public safety measures. We have nutrition services in schools. We have income maintenance programs through the, uh, instead of the community development, the, uh, the uh, community services block grant program, right? We do job training. So it's all about thinking, you know, as I sort of lay out all my resources, if I'm the captain of the ship, if I'm the mayor of whatever city, and I think about all the things that I have, I have a police department, I have public schools, I have housing, I have streets, I have sanitation, I have all these different things. How do I understand the underlying dimensions of the market and begin to prioritize how to get things into those places so that they can be most impactful in terms of sustaining and building those markets and the people that live within them? So a neat exercise for folks oftentimes is how do you do this? Now in the city of New Orleans, I think that to do this properly, there's things, um, It's it's more than just identification of these things. I do think looking at some of the topography makes an awful lot of sense. Um, it's not an issue in Philadelphia, but it is here, right? Um, so overlaying things on top of the MVA before maybe you make some of these decisions makes an awful lot of sense. But it makes an awful lot of sense to think about your tools, think about your markets, and decide how you want to prioritize. And lastly, right now, uh, we're sort of in the midst of a project looking at the quality of life things that attach to different communities. And what we did is we adopted this logic that said our yellows and blues, those are basically our stable real estate markets. And the conditions that exist along things like safety and education and amenities and prosperity and commerce and the like, 
whatever level they exist in those places, really, they should be able to exist in other places. There's no reason that if you're poor or have a low-valued house, that you shouldn't have access to a food store, to a good place to send your children to school, to be able to walk down the street, to have a decent park to go and walk in or have your children play in. I tell you, in St. Louis, from the far ends of the spectrum of that real estate market, every park is world-class. Every library is world-class. They made decisions about investing in these places. And so Philadelphia's logic is sort of built off of that a little bit. There's no reason that a place, regardless of its economic level, shouldn't have good things. So what we're trying to do now is measure safety and education and housing and amenities and prosperity and commerce benchmarked against those yellow and blue real estate markets. We put them out and then we work with our city council people to start to think about, okay, when my police department comes in with their budget for the year, or when my recreation department comes in looking for their capital budget for the year, I can look at this and say, why aren't you proposing to do a rec center in, some of, in, in a place that is inadequately served by a rec center? What decisions are you making? If you're gonna do five, where's the most appropriate five to do? And therein, again, it's a matter of balancing market, and frankly, as I started out with, it's about balancing equity as well. And with that, what we do is essentially think about each one of those horizontal lines as representing the whole city, the gold bar representing where those yellow and blue markets are, and the little houses representing where that particular neighborhood is. So <clears throat> this is a particular neighborhood that is just way falling off on public safety. It's below where you need it to be on education. It's okay on amenities. It's below in prosperity, et cetera. So you can start to think about the various combinations of things. And again, as a city council person, as a mayor, it gives you an ability to say, as I think about budgeting, as I think about planning, as I think about programming, I'm doing it now with more information than just the MVA. I'm thinking about these uh, other quality of life things. And so with that, now I'm going to stop. <laughs> so.